So okay. the topic today is basically um, I'm going to cover some of the performance uh, improvements that were done um, uh, in the past in the past uh, six months to a year, I think. Um, that uh, people are starting to sort of look deeper into NVMe or TCP and uh, understand how they can optimize it further. Um, we're going to cover um, a bit of that, or um, at least in high level. Um, um, in case I didn't introduce myself, Sagi Grimberg. Uh, I work for Lightbits, where I act as a CTO. I'm also a co one of the maintainers of the NVMe subsystem, the Linux kernel. There are three of us. Um, and um, that's it, basically. Happy to be here. So I'm going to start with a short intro. If you didn't happen to hear uh, NVMe over TCP in former uh, um, talks that were here today or before that, NVMe over TCP is basically just the standard transport binding to basically network NVMe protocol um, and and the queuing interface on top of a standard TCP IP network. Um, basically, it's the same NVMe multi queue interface. In the Linux case, it runs just on top of, uh, of TCP uh, sockets. Nothing very fancy around that. Um, in terms of the interface, um, you know, from the spec perspective, um, it's really transparent into the you know, the core command sets, so it's basically exactly the same. What NVMe over TCP does is basically um, encapsulates um, NVMe commands or data um, into what we call NVMe over TCP PDUs, which uh, stands for protocol data units. If we look at the layering, basically NVMe is the high level architecture queuing interface um, and command sets. NVMe over fabrics sort of took NVMe and um, expanded it to something that doesn't have, you know, PCIe hardly bound into the into the concept of of the of uh, the overall NVMe architecture. And the transport binding part, that's where NVMe uh, TCP sort of sits, and basically translates into uh, uh, the encapsulation and and uh, and mapping um, between the transport or network channel to the concept of an NVMe queue. Below that, there's the NVMe transport itself. And in NVMe TCP case, that will be TCP IP, of course. Um, you know, um, just to, to make it one, one, equivalent to an, an, an other transports that could be an RDMA-based transport or fiber channel that also exists. Um, in terms of the implementation uh, in Linux, um, basically every NVMe Q pair is mapped into a bidirectional TCP socket. We don't sort of use two sockets for you know submission and completion. Uh, we use a, a single TCP socket for that. Um, command commands and data transfers. And if we look at at um, at the drawing here, we have the host on the left side and the controller. Um, you know, from the host perspective, there's a submission queue and a completion queue. This sort of uh, our uh, uh, queuing interface from the core layer or from you know higher level block layer of other ULPs into the driver itself, basically submit it through a, through a queue or a virtual queue, I would say. And then we have basically an I/O thread that sort of uh, is either triggered from the host software, you know, the, the request queued by, um, you know, either the user or the file system, um, or it gets triggered from, from network if it has, you know, SK buffs to sort of crunch from the network or it has some space, it has a um, st space that's uh, sort of um, available in the socket or the socket has a state change that, you know, it needs to go into recover stuff for whatever reason or clean up. So this sort of I/O thread, it's a single thread that you know, in um, in the general case, it would do a send receive. We don't use different threads to do send and receives. It's going to do a, in a loop. Um, the implementation specifically is a bound work queue. Um, I used the bound work queue initially just because it's a it's a very convenient interface. You know, you can basically it has clear semantics uh, on how the queue work. You can sort of affinitize it to a CPU core if you want. 
you can easily cancel work you can you can fl you can drain a work queue um, so it's very convenient if you want to sort of uh, handle uh, um, errors and whatnot, correctly quiesce IO, it has very clear semantics. Um, I think that, you know, if we're uh, digging deeper and uh, looking into um, um, pro pro improving the imp uh, performance of the driver, um, maybe, you know, lightweight K-threads um, or a different interface that is um, less heavy weight still but still guarantees some of the uh work you uh um semantics that we rely on for example for a work item not to be re-entrant um that could boost also uh performance and improve latency quite a bit um basically this whole picture of uh, you know having you know a queuing interface and the completion context uh from usually from driven from the user context itself uh, or file system or whoever uh, um, issued the IO. Um, uh, we have that context. We have a general context that is uh, the, the IO thread itself that handles the network mostly. Um, this is sort of an, on a per queue basis. And by default, usually um, that will be sort of uh, um, replicated uh, on a per core basis. So we have a, a multi-core system um, each CPU core will have its own dedicated queue and dedicated TCP socket. Um, so in terms of uh, all the um, uh, scaling, it should scale fairly well, depending, uh, of course, on, on uh, stuff that we'll get into. So if we look at, you know, what are the latency contributions that were identified and sort of ra raised in, in, um, in recent times, we can see uh, different aspects. First of all is serialization. So, I mean, NVMe um, over TCP was such a heavy, uh, a big lift from, you know, SCSI based protocols that you have a, a really native sort of multi-queue interface. So serial serialization is pretty lightweight. It's only on a, um, on a per queue basis. And, you know, all throughout the stack um, from the block layer and down downwards, we put a lot of emphasis to not have sort of uh, global um, global wide serialization points, um, but there are some serializations that are on a per queue basis. Um, we're going to talk about that. You need to serialize the the hardware context that you're uh, uh, processing. Um, each hardware context or hardware queue has a dedicated socket, which is also sort of uh, needs to be serialized. Um, context switching, um, I think that uh, the Cornell uh, team uh, has talked about that before. We have um, two at a minimum, if we're talking about low Q depth, um, with high Q depths could be slightly amortized, but still um, we have two at a minimum uh, per IO. Memory copy, so um, um, it's only on RX, all the send uh, operation or TX operations are, are zero copy. Um, on RX, not a huge contributor to latency from what we see, at least from, you know, uh, generic x86 uh, uh, system that are usually, um, usually tend to get um, bigger if they're hosting, you know, something like a database or whatnot. Um, but in high load, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can get uh, visible for sure. Interrupts, uh, definitely impactful. Um, the proliferation or, you know, once the load starts to build up, um, interrupts and, uh, and context switches together um, make a, definitely an impact. You know, you have receive offloads or adaptive, uh, adaptive interrupt moderation can mitigate a bit. Um, um, and they do often, but um, it, the problem is that it doesn't come with, a, it comes with a cost. Latency is usually less consistent. Um, and depending on whatever heuristics um, that um, that comes from the NIC implementation itself, the socket overhead um, it exists not not huge. Um, what we see is that if we have a lot of small um, um, either RX activity or, or small payload TX activity, uh, we start to see this overhead sort of uh, bottle up. Uh, we all, all also have affinitization where definitely it can be a contributor to latency if not affinitized correctly. 
Um, you know, if we have a, usually a, a, a queue on a per CPU basis, um, if, you know, the five tuple doesn't happen to map to that uh, CPU core, it may happen to sort of uh, uh, finitize to a different NUMA socket can definitely have some impact. There are some techniques around it, you know, have been mentioned here and in other places, uh, techniques like ARFS, some flow steering magic or, um, or uh, also AD ADQ as well. Um, cache pollution, uh, again, not as excessive given the, assuming you have a, a sufficiently large cache, you know, that you can find on, you know, mid-range CPU. Um, as I said, as the load starts to build up and you're talking about millions of IOPS uh, in a single system, uh, from the host perspective, it can uh, bottle up. And one more item is the head of line blocking part um, that is definitely apparent in mixed workloads. Um, so basically NVMe over TCP is basically, you know, if we look at from the bottom side, it's really just messaging protocol on top of TCP streams, right? Um, so if, you know, my queue happens to now be transferring um, um, a one meg of data, um, it really cannot fit sort of a, a small read that's, you know, only a 64 byte command uh, uh, structure down all the way down to the controller. Um, because, you know, once it started the message, it sort of committed um, for, you know, a large payload. Uh, so this is something that uh, can definitely be apparent. We're going to talk about some of the stuff um, that uh, were added to address that. So here's just an illustration, very, very high level of, um, you know, asynchronous direct IO, uh, usually where applications sort of care more about latency or, or throughput, um, they'll uh, use that interface. Um, all the other interfaces, um, Beneath the covers will that work that way. Just uh, um, you know, um, it could be the file system itself that uh, that is issuing the I/O, not the user. But definitely, but you know, if we look at step one, user user uh, issues um, a file or or a block I/O using you know AIO or IU ring. That you know goes down to to the kernel. It's a syscall, obviously. That may be issued directly to the driver itself, or it's um, uh, goes into an IO scheduler, may, may context switch um, 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 or not. Eventually, you know, all the block IO is being uh, prepared and then um, it's calling directly, it's going to in, in step two to the uh, device driver or the block driver and calls it queue, queue that request now. Um, what NVMe over TCP does is that it prepares a PDU um, and it places it on its own queue. Um, the historic reason for that was that um, the queue request uh, in uh, context was not allowed to sleep, and I, we cannot send anything that's uh, um, and guarantee that we won't ever sleep in there because it has at least a mutex uh, involved. So what we did, we always deferred into a different context to to uh, uh, to uh, send it and process it from the network. And also, you know, everything is uh, is non-blocking. So basically, we have this I/O context that will just pick pick requests and process pick requests from the this queue, process them, send them to the network, um, get uh, network from get payload from the network, complete I/Os will locate the original request, complete them. Um, when an I/O basically uh, uh, completes from the controller end after being sent uh, um, in step three. Uh, from the I/O context, um, it will send back, you know, the data and/or the completion, um, and the NIC on the host side will basically generate an interrupt. Then NAPI is triggered from software IQ, obviously, um, and then you know calls uh, the driver that says that you know we have some SKB SK buffs to uh, to basically process. From there, we're not going to uh, process them directly and uh, sort of. Um, read from the socket, we're going to trigger the same IO context that does send, receive, send, receive, send, receive. Um, so that is basically one more inherent context switches, uh, one, one more context switch, and then the user context completes, you know, 
called io get events um and found you know an event that it can uh, basically it's uh, original io has completed so the point here is basically uh, to focus that uh, you know all the uh, um, syscalls context with software queues not within the control but we do have these two contexts which is that are um are a sort of native to the to the driver itself so let's talk a bit about um and just going to enumerate some of the uh optimizations that were that were made uh first of all the linux lock layer we i talked about head of queue blocking and how it affects mixed workloads um Initially, I've attempted to sort of, whenever I sort of, uh, from the IO context, whenever we sort of process an IO or select a, an IO to be processed, we try to look at the queue and try to sort of reorder IOs that, you know, small payloads will come first so we don't get head of line blocking or whatnot. Um, really um, took a step back and said, this is something that fits an IO scheduler and block driver has no business uh, deciding and doing anything, any of this stuff. Uh, so I sort of dropped it and said, all right, um, you know, someone that cares about that will implement um, uh, uh, an IO scheduler and I don't need to worry about that. Uh, but the best solution that, uh, that uh, to a problem is not to have the problem at all. So Linux, uh, the block layer basically grew the capabilities to have multiple Q maps, which means that now, you know, uh, it comes in the expense that now basically the host will open more queues. Basically, it will have a set of queues that will uh, just uh, transfer normal IO or stuff that uh, we call write that has uh, data going from the host to the target. It has dedicated set of um, queues that are uh, designed that read IO or data that coming from the controller back to the host um, are going to be placed on. And then there's a set of uh, dedicated uh, queues that are designed for polling or, or for um, uh, high priority function uh, uh, flags uh, on specific IOs. And that's optimizing uh, for you know, latency sensitive IO the user interface, you can do that on a per IO basis. You can turn on or off this flag using either IO U-Ring um, or period, period V2 or PWrite V2. Um, so basically what we have here is that, you know, if, the, if an IO that, uh, that we're, sending, uh, we're sending it to a controller, it goes to a different queue than you know a small payload that we send uh, um, uh, to the controller. It's not really uh, stuck behind this large transfer because these are now different NVMe queues, which maps to different TCP sockets. So basically, the whole messaging is completely um, um, orthogonal now. So what? happened is that once you turn this on, it's not on by default because it, as I said, it will translate into more NVMe queues um, and which maps to more TCP sockets, which is pretty cheap today. So uh, people do tend to use it. And I've seen people sort of turning this on before, but the test I did to sort of, uh, um, or the test that was used to sort of um, explain and, and show the benefit is that I had like 16 sort of readers, quote unquote, that issued, you know, queued up one, just synchronous 4K reads, um, uh, just one by one. And in the background, I have this unbound writer thread that issues a large queued up 32 of one megabyte IOs uh, and sort of so, um, bounced around different CPUs. Uh, and then we looked at, you know, the read QoS that uh, was derived from that. There's the read IOPS, um, um, almost uh, more than 2x uh, improvement. Same for the average latency. Obviously, we're talking about queued up one, so it can definitely uh, have a one-to-one -one impact. But the biggest uh, improvement was the 4.9s or the 4.9 tail latency, which uh, was uh, an order of magnitude better. So this is something that uh, sort of the block layer has grown the capability um, to address uh, for different use cases for you know uh, NVMe PCI devices, but something that definitely helps NVMe over TCP. The support um, adding in the driver was easy; just add the ability to allocate more 
TCP connections or add more queues if the user requests it, and just plug it into the infrastructure telling the block layer that we just have, we support more mapping, more uh, queue maps than just map the software context into the hardware queue correctly. So some, some affinity, affinitization improvements um, have uh, affinity improvements. So as I said, um, the performance um, and the latency specifically um, has, is impacted by affinity. So again, Linux has grown some capabilities for us to split different IO types into different queue maps. Um, and as I also mentioned, each IO, each IO queue will have its own CPU that it will always work on, right? The, the IO thread will always run on that uh, CPU core. And in order to have uh, um, uh, better support for, you know, read the specific uh, uh, workload and polling uh, driven workload, you want to have the affinity sort of uh, aligned well in case you have a set of queues that are uh, um, uh, that uh, are dedicated to host each type of IO. So what was done here is that basically you have uh, multiple queue maps. The affinity or the IO CPU that we use to uh, to uh, give any type of queue sort of calculated all the queue maps um, combined, which got us into some, uh, uh, given that we have different mapping of queues that uh, uh, could be of different sizes, could got us to bad accounting in terms of, uh, uh, you know, you have an application thread that runs on CPU number three, for example. And then from all the accounting, given that we have multiple queue maps, the IO context will be, would run either on a different core, on sibling core, on the same NUMA node, um, or you know, even a core on a different NUMA node. Um, that uh, definitely hurt uh, the performance. And also, you know, um, turning on um, ARFS or you know, specific ADQ techniques um, um, that were uh, uh, that were discussed and referenced before. So the improvement was, you know, on the QDAP1 latency, we can see a 10% improvement. You know, I'll buy that any day. You know, from 30 microseconds added latency compared to a disk device. This specific test that was done by Mark uh, from, from Intel, um, 30 microseconds cut us in down to 27 uh, average uh, latency in, two, uh, in microseconds. And the IOPS also um, in a high QDAP on a single core uh, rose from 180k IOPS into 230k IOPS. So maybe uh, I'm now noticing that I don't have a lot of information on the graph, but basically it's just 4k reads on a single CPU core on the whole side. Um, and you know we have QDEP1 latency and then uh, QDEP32 IOPS number. So the IOPS sort of improved just by affinitizing correctly, um, and the latency improved um, based on the fact that uh, now uh, you know, the application, the IO thread are running on the same CPU. Another, uh, or another set of the optimizations were specifically around low QDAP latency optimization. So we talked about this uh, NVMe TCP IO context that will own the IO, I'm sorry, that will own the IO uh, processing. Um, uh, the point is that, you know, when the request is queued, uh, we wanna, if the queue is sort of, uh, if, we, if it's possible, we wanna send it down the network and avoid the context switching into the NVMe TCP IO uh, work queue. Um, the, uh, the network of, as I said, sending something from the network, uh, uh, sending something to the network might sleep. So we need to convert the hardware context or the context that Q request uh, is running in into a sleepable context. So we need to change the locking scheme into from RCU based into SRCU allow, allowing us to sleep. The block layer, you know, grew that capability so we can leverage it now, although it's, it's more heavyweight, but you know, uh, uh, empirical trial uh, experiments show that it's uh, worthwhile to avoid a context switch, which is, which is really, you know, the enemy. Um, 
you need to now basically serialize two contexts that will now uh, um, access the sockets, uh, the same socket basically. So we haven't introduced a mutex around that. But the point is that we don't want to take it um, unless we know that the overhead is small. So we only try this optimization if the queue is empty, meaning that we don't have a lot of requests uh, that are uh, bottled before us. And only um, if the IO thread mapped CPU matches the context that we're running on, meaning that if we do take the lock, it will be only contending with the same, with another context on the same CPU. Um, so that uh, will I'll give uh, um, the results later after we talk also about the Oryx uh, path optimization. So basically here, instead of queuing the, the IO to a different context to be sent from there, we just send it directly from the user IO context. Remember the user issued the IO, it goes down to the driver, it actually in the same context will go down uh, to the network, down to the controller as well. So on the Rx path, um, Linux grew polling interface uh, for IO, for latency sensitive IO and polling is becoming more of a thing uh, with uh, the emergence of fast uh, devices, both on networking and storage. The interface is uh, basically submission with a, a high priority flag. And you can basically pull for comp completion either uh, via IO U-ring that basically IO get events will uh, go down actually all the way down to the uh, device level and pull for a completion. Uh, what we did in NVMe over TCP, we added basically uh, NVMe TCP poll and plug it into you know, the polling infrastructure and the block layer uh, um, uh, and uh, in upper level stacks, uh, hook it, you know, all the way up to IOU ring in terms of flag, uh, flag uh, exposure. Um, we added basically now a set of queues that are designed for polling, um, but you know they're still interrupt driven. But opportunistically, you know, if the application will will enter uh, polling, uh, will basically call polling, and we do SK busy loop, assuming that we can. And uh, it has a chance to actually find uh, uh, completions or payload or data or Rx payload um, before you know an interrupt is, is triggered and uh, possibly will uh, have latency improvements. So that's one optimization. The other optimization is basically when we do see a data ready and whether we call polling or not, we will see data ready once, uh, you know, not be prepared, you know, uh, we have uh, data prepared for us in the socket layer. Um, we're going to context switch automatically. Um, what the optimization here is that if we're uh, detecting that the user is polling, we sort of skip uh, uh, firing that uh, Rx uh, uh, context, avoid the context switch, um, and let the polling uh, sort of uh, uh, um, pull the data, pull the Rx data itself. Mostly, you know, experiments show that mostly true. Um, if NIC moderation, adaptive moderation works well, you know, you don't see a lot of interrupts. Um, and if the device holds off, interrupts more aggressively, like in the ADQ case, it works even better. So moving on forward, after that, we have some more improvements. Just uh, on the single queued app, we see that uh, um, we have uh, um, another sort of 10% uh, improvement in the queued up one latency. And then uh, in high queued up, which surprisingly um, um, also got an improvement, what we're thinking is that basically um, the specific uh, experiment that uh, uh, issued IOs one by one. So basically it was sent to the wire and the wire was not congested. So it was able to pass. So um, another improvement for low QDAP, but also uh, high QDAP uh, optimization, basically um, avoiding context switches um, if it's possible. In terms of High queued up latency optimization. This uh, sort of uh, the concept came from the Cornell gang, Rachit and the and the team. Uh, if a high queued up uh, is building up in the queue, we want to leverage that information and optimize, you know, mi mitigate some context switches and optimize how we handle the network traffic. 
And the block layer is able to do that uh, to indicate down to the driver if this request that it's being uh, queued is the last one in, in the batch. Um, that was sort of introduced into uh, the um, batch doorbells and NVMe PCI, mostly for shadow doorbells for virtualization uh, use cases where doorbells are more expensive. But we can now utilize it in, in, uh, in NVMe over TCP. Basically, the block data that arrives uh, basically has the last um, Boolean indicator. Um, what we did is to basically modify the driver that you know it's a software or virtual queue from a, the request submission into the IO, IO context, uh, uh, move from a list into a lockless list that is being processed in a batch gives the driver some better view of the queue that is building within the driver. And also we sort of, we looked at uh, this last indicator that had a, have a, a more clear, a, a better view into the queue that is building up in the block layer itself, uh, whether it's an IO scheduler or just a, um, a queue that is building up due to, um, to uh, um, the way that the IO pattern is. And then we basically schedule the IO thread only when the last is last in bed sort of arrives. And the second optimization is that we sort of uh, use message flags for message more and send page note not last. Um, if it's not you know the last IO the, the last payload that we have to send in the, into the network, we have we know that we have more. Um, or just uh, turn on message EOR if it's it is the last in batch. Um, and, and on top of that, we have the uh, batching support uh, or improvement that came uh, from Ming Lei uh, from Red Hat uh, for uh, specifically for in the case of IO schedulers. And the specific graph, uh, uh, the specific improvement is also measurable without IO schedulers, but with IO schedulers, um, um, this um, fix is needed. And then, um, uh, the third in, the third part is uh, the work that uh, Rachit and uh, the Cornell team is doing right now is basically implement the concepts of the I-10 paper, uh, which really introduces um, I.O. scheduling optimization as a first class citizen I.O. scheduler uh, that is based into, that is sort of optimized um, optimizations that it introduced are centered around TCP streams for you know, these sort of uh, block devices. Um, I'll give some uh, uh, reference um, from the measurements that uh, the team has done. Um, so for, you know, on the left-hand side, if we looked at uh, latency and IOPS, um, the similar uh, graphs uh, that uh, Rachid has uh, presented, um, with if you sacrifice some of the uh, 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 latency uh, uh, attributes, you can actually get higher uh, or you know a noticeable improvement um, in uh, IOPS per core, and that is specific to the test setup and, uh, and the, the test configuration that was done uh, by the Cornell team. If we look at the right hand side, um, basically you know for different request sizes. Um, there is uh, obviously an advantage here um, on throughput uh, with the I-10 I/O scheduler uh, or line, uh, running on top of NVMe TCP from NVMe TCP alone. Um, that is sort of um, both of them uh, sort of emphasize the advantages of uh, of batching. And I think that I I. I'm now ready to take questions. I wasn't sure how I'm doing on time, so I might have rushed a bit. So uh, sharing and I'll take questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the questions to you, Sag. Oh, okay. Uh, well, if you can put up your slides, actually it seems like your slide number four has generated some questions. Can you put back your slide number four? Yes. This is all right. So slide number four, uh, and now my Q and A disappeared from the screen. Shri, do you want to ask the question? Oh, I, I can actually, it, yeah. it's a very simple question. So this this right. latency contribution summary is that host controller or both, right? Because I think the pattern and the profile changes whether you're 
looking at it as an yeah. initiator. Or as yeah, well. yeah. I, maybe I did not mention that. Um, the focus here is is really on the host side. Um, there has been work to also optimize the target side, but uh, um, the target side is usually uh, people view it as a reference uh, implementation or a testing vehicle. Um, uh, usually people use commercial targets. So um, the focus of the conversation is really on the host side itself. Um, the target uh, it, that is being used for um, most of of uh, of, uh, of the measurements is indeed the Linux target, um, but there is but there's uh, less work um, that uh, has been done to optimize the target side. Although I do know that uh, the Intel team uh, has uh, some uh, patches that uh, um, are in the pipe to also optimize and improve the performance of the Linux and VMTCP target. Excellent. Thank All you. Right. Next question is from Rachid. Um, okay, so this, he thought uh, you had an interesting work on the mixed workloads. Uh, question is, what is the impact on throughput per core? Right. Also, what is the overhead of having more queues, more queue maps? Yeah. So the overhead is uh, is is not uh, substantial at all. It really depends on what are the hardware resources uh, uh, that are needed uh, for every specific uh, hardware queue. In the case of NVMe TCPs, um, it's really um, only the infrastructure that's needed to add uh, another uh, TCP socket context. So it's very, very fairly cheap compared to, uh, for example, uh, if you take hardware resources for an RDMA adapter, which is also not not as not not very expensive, uh, so the cost is not is not huge, uh, so it's definitely worth to have uh, multiple uh, uh, queue maps, and also if you think about it, usually a host will not be connected to thousands of controllers. It will have you know um, up to tens of controllers in the even the most uh, if we're, if we're, the host is connected into a large cluster, it will have tens of controllers, and each of them will have a uh, um, um, you know, it will open on a per per core basis a set of queue. You can multiply that by two. Not we're not talking about huge numbers that can actually impact you know how the stack is running, even for the most most ex extreme cases. So not a lot of uh, overhead in terms of the throughput improvement. Um, if you know the mix, if the workload is mixed, then definitely uh, you have zero blocking between you know. Rx and Tx, or read-driven operations and write-driven operations, so the, the throughput improves dramatically. I hope that answers the question. Does it answer the question, Rashid? As always, great, Saji, thanks. <laughs>